generation, perhaps if there's some uh, younger people that roll up that haven't even heard of Pat McCabe in Ballarat, yeah, it'd be a great thing as well, I think. Oh, definitely. You always hope for that um, for that sort of thing to happen, um, to get people, uh, especially part of this festival where there's all different genres and and um, gigs and venues. Um, it would be absolutely terrific to see, say, someone standing there having a, a beer who's 18, 19, 20, um, listening to some of these melodies and words and thinking, wow, this is from Ballarat. This is pretty cool. Totally. Yeah. Because uh, as you said, like um, finding Pat's music is, it is difficult. I've got one of his albums called Glow. Yep. But I can't find it for the life of me. I know that I have it. Yep. And I've played on the radio show before because it's got that great opening track, um, Your Mama Was a Sucker for Love. Yes, yeah. Which yeah. I love that are you do you know who's going to perform that on the night yeah um that seemed to be the most kind of funkiest kind of pat mccabe song if you and the only person that was i thought of was stella savvy cool who would just um nail it to the wall really so that was stella and we've got a backing band um the vests who pat has played with in the past um and we're going to be playing as a as a backing band to several guests as well as guests just do it on their own but Stella's going to be playing that song awesome yeah. and um the dead salesman duo are going to be playing some songs so you and Ryder will be getting up and playing some tunes not only from pat mckay but from um patty o'driscoll and the nolte grips and the mavises as well um what um pat songs did you guys decide on and for what reason well the funny thing is, when we were putting this together, I said to Ryder, let's do um, some other artists um, because we like to play, um, especially Patty O'Driscoll songs and uh, the Noldy Grip song that Peter Krebin, um pretty much co-wrote. Uh, but what was happening was um, we kept getting people t asking to join the bill. So we really had to strip it back to Ryder and I just um, playing Pat McCabe songs now. Oh, okay. Because we have the two shows, we were originally going to get up and do six to eight songs and a couple of Pat McCabe songs, but now um, we had so much interest from other artists, we've uh, we've stripped back our set, which I'm, I'm more than happy with because we can get more Pat McCabe songs in the mix. Excellent. So when I first met Ryder back in the late 80s, he had one of Pat's singles. It was a little orange single that had... Um, Swimming Pool and The Ballad of Miss Audrey Dash on uh, was the B and A side. And um, so we were both keen to do both of them, but Swimming Pool is just so incredibly popular. You'll see a couple, you'll hear a couple of versions of that, people, if you come, because it's such a popular song. But The Ballad of Audrey Dash um, is, is one song that uh, we're going to play. And um, a song called Sugar and Smoke that he wrote um, after the death of Patrick O'Driscoll. Uh, and it's such a beautiful song, and uh, it's probably one of the most recent songs he has, really. Um, and that's a hidden gem that we found on YouTube. And then once we play, we just move on to solo acts and um, and bands coming out and, and playing. It'll be completely 100% McCabe now, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Well... The man just walked in the studio, so I might um I might chuck on one of his songs. This is um Patrick McCabe um, live with his song Honey Jar, and uh, is someone performing this on the night? Are you aware who's doing this one? Pa uh, happy? Yes, I am. We've got um, Emma Grant. She's going to be performing this. Um, Beautiful. And she sounds sounds like the Cowboy Junkies. She's just got a great voice and uh, sitting really well with the band. All right. Well, let's uh, give it a let's give it a spin. This is Pat McCabe live with uh, Honey Jar. This is a recording, and uh, Pat's going to come in the studio, and uh, we'll have a bit of a chat very shortly. So hang in there, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have you 
Got a telephone no ring Cause my bird won't sing I need help from above Now that I ain't got your love Used to live in strawberry clover Now I don't cause it's over Used to live in the haunted jar Roll up my sleeves, see my scars I need help from above Now that I need Got your love Put the bottle to my lips Like some kind of perverted Crazy kid don't come knocking at my door Cause I don't live around here no more Don't ever bother coming around Cause I've shifted to another town I need help from above That I need got your love. love. <laughs> There's uh, Pat McCabe there with Honey Jar will perform live and uh, at the moment I've got Hap and Pat now in the studio and we're talking about a very Ballarat evening of music this Friday night at the main bar, um, the songs of Pat McCabe. There's going to be two shows, one at 8pm and one at 9.30pm. It's free entry for Songways uh, ticket holders, which is the festival that uh, this um, event is a part of this weekend or otherwise it's $10 just for the show only. And it'll be uh, the Dead Salesman duo um, playing all Pat McCabe songs, as Hap just confirmed um, before. And uh, mm. Stella, um, Stella Savvy, uh, Earl Leonard, Christine Allen, Emma Grant, Troy Wilson, and uh, 23rd of Elvis, and hopefully Terry Byrne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, Pat McCabe himself. And um, I guess just to... Just to kick it off tonight, Pat, if you don't mind. Yeah, hi, g'day, Matt. Hey, Hap. <laughs> Sorry I'm a little bit late, but... Hap, Hap was just early. I had to put, oh, Hap was early? <laughs> yeah. That's, is... I'm a bit worried. That's a bit ominous. Of <laughs> no. It's only... Hap beat me, so, yeah. <laughs> but I'm pretty known to be a bit uh, tardy, too. In the, But I've got a good excuse. I had to put the chickens to bed, so... Fair enough. It's a pretty rock and roll uh, excuse, I reckon. Yep. If you're Paul McCartney and you just sort of split up with wings, you know. That's right. Going back to whatever year that was. Ram. Ram. That's a great album. It is a great album. Um, I guess just for listeners that aren't um, necessarily familiar with you, Pat, um, tell us a bit about yourself, where you're from and are wow. you born and bred Ballarat? Or? No, no, I grew up in the um, the Western District. I always say that. It really sounds, you know, like sort of pretty posh when you say that, but... 
you know, they think you're a squatter or something, you've got a thousand acres or a couple of thousand acres, but I grew up in a little town called Cobden. Yep. Um, about 1,200 population between Colac and Warrnambool, Port Campbell. And, um, yeah, I just sort of started playing guitar when I was young, 12 or something, and played in bands with my mates and... Um, yeah, just sort of loved doing that and then probably started writing a few songs and then sort of we moved to Geelong and then we started, this is in the halcyon days of Aussie rock and roll and you'd you know, go and support bands in the pub and we sort of did that for a few years in Melbourne and yeah. remember, uh, I think it was 1981, Deacon Orientation Week and we, we opened up, we were called The Propellers and then there was a band called... Uh, Serious Young Insects. Oh, yeah. They sort of, they were free piece. I've heard that name. It's um, Richard Pleasance, I reckon. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. And then they sort of morphed into Boom Crash Opera. Yeah, wow. But they had this amazing three piece around the time. Yeah. They were really good. And then that, we were on the first stage, one stage, and then the other stage was like, actually, I saw a photo the other day. Of the, it was um, In Excess, just when um, The Loved One just came out, that single, 81. Wow. So, it was a photo the other day, and they just they look like babies, you know, like Michael Hutchins. Yeah. So that was, and after that was Midnight Oil, so it was just like this incredible gig, and then, you know, it was all sort of, we thought it was all happening, and you know what the rock and roll business yeah. is like. It's sort of the finals wouldn't have been, would have been around that era yeah, too. And, yeah. yeah. Never play with them, play with like the models and... Uh, you know those little pubs in Melbourne, Macy's, the Jump Club, which turned into the club. Oh yeah, in Collingwood. Collingwood Smith Street, yeah. Yeah. But you know it was really sort of happening then. Well, it wasn't really because you were still getting like fifty dollars and having to load in the PA and load it out. And Isn't it funny how that's still happening now? <laughs> <laughs> it's Just it's exactly the same now. <laughs> get treated like but the economy never changes. It seems in right. Well, it never went up. The Muso's money is just sort of yeah. You had, had to get a real job mm. unless you yeah um what was the um just when you you said at, you're at 12 you picked up the guitar for the first time what was it that made you want to take that leap and pick up mm. that instrument what well was, was it were your parents musical yeah was my mum was musical she played the piano and so there was always sort of music around and you know that's gone back away without you know that was sort of like I suppose Johnny Cash show was on TV and yeah right um, yeah it's just a sort of a thing to do but yeah and um, as you said you played in the propellers for um, how long we um, in that band that for? probably went for a couple of years and then just sort of self imploded we ran into um, a lot of drumming drummer problems okay. almost like spinal spinal tap, tap just <laughs> blowing up on you <laughs> almost. And you were playing yeah. original stuff then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, you know, you were rehearsing a couple of three nights a week or something and playing a couple of nights and, yep. you know, you're all gung-ho. And Was that based out of Melbourne mainly or Geelong? Yeah, yeah, okay. Geelong, Melbourne, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then um, after the... Oh, and then that sort of, yeah, imploded, I guess. And then, yeah, my mum was living in Ballarat then. Yeah, my dad died and she moved back to Ballarat. She was originally from Ballarat, so... Okay. Sort of ended up in Ballarat and then just sort of started hanging around, playing around a bit in Ballarat. Yeah, yeah right. What year do you think you came to the, the Rat then? Well, I reckon it was probably uh, 82, 83, I reckon. Okay. Right. How would you describe the Ballarat music scene at that at that time when yeah, you first well, arrived? See, that was even before the camp, I think, putting music on at the camp. I reckon we were the first band to go in there. Yeah, right. Um, the slow burning fuse or whatever we were called then. Yep. And then there wasn't a lot of happening at the Bridge Mall in. There was, I think Peter Couples used to play there a bit, and Peter Creven used to play with his mate singing. Yeah. Of a Saturday night because they used to have to have a bit of entertainment to keep it open later, I think. Okay. And then it become a little bit more established. They started having bands regularly then. Yep. What year was that around when the Bridge Mall and the camp kind of really came uh, to fruition? I reckon, now I'm thinking, so 84, it's probably coming up 86, I reckon. Okay. This is just random off the top of my head, so 
but I reckon it was probably around 86 because, yeah, I reckon I come back from Melbourne 85. Oh, now. Yeah, I reckon things sort of started pumping then and then, like, um, Voice FM was Triple B then. Yep. And that was a bit of a, you know, they had the cross currents and that was a bit of a, probably, that was probably the first time I really played in Ballarat cross currents with Triple B. Mm. Wow. Dave Dullenberg. And Those gigs were awesome as a teenager. I reckon I went to one in 86 or 87 and um, it just was fantastic. It was yeah. in the SMB old cafeteria. Would that be right? Or? I think they had one there, but it was always at the St. Paul's Hall up next to um, where the Battlers Tavern was, which is the old Munster Arms Hotel. Okay. The hall there for a long time. Yeah. And before that, I think they used to be out in the old Horton Arena. Yeah. Which is sort of just all boarded up but but yeah I just come in in those days when they're at St Paul's Hall for ages of mm. Sunday at night and a Sunday night Sunday night isn't that funny like Sunday night you couldn't imagine people rocking out on a Sunday nah. night or getting punters there nah, it was um. always yeah pretty pretty happening the old cross currents so burning fuse became the fused and that was a three-piece, and that were, they were fantastic. Just from my perspective, that's when I first started going out and seeing bands, and um, they were um, a fantastic band. Yeah, I probably had the idea, you know, I'd come back and try and do what I was doing Geelong, Melbourne, and the same sort of formula, like three-piece bass drums, myself, and um, that's probably where that sort of formula for that come from. Yeah. And then I had, yeah, Robert Bell, he was really good on, he was a hot drummer. And Chris Morris, he was sort of just starting out in the bass, but it was a really good sort of combination. As yeah. you know, he went on to work with Chris. And yep. Yeah, and we sort of played the bridgey, sort of had a residency there for a while. And Tell us a bit about the music of the Fuse, because I've, I've never heard any nah, of the well, Fuse. So. It was just that sort of three-piece pub rock, I suppose, it was trying to doing a bit, of, a little bit of everything maybe, you know, it had sort of moments of a bit of funk and a bit of, because probably, yeah, my influence, influence was were like The Who maybe and The Jam and yep. all these three pieces bands, you know, like The Police and yep. just really love working that format, but yep. I probably, I couldn't sort of do that now, it's too hard to work, like, because you just sort of feel like you're... Everybody's really working hard towards yeah. the sound. There is something about a three-piece thing, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that was such a great band. It was very... You were writing genuine pop songs in a way too that were coming across very um, rock. And, um, yeah. and that drummer was um, from Barrett High School, a few yeah. years older than me. He was Don Kirby's kind of protege. Yeah, yeah. I'd never seen a drummer like him too wow. as well. He was just... Uh, I wonder if he's still making a living of drumming because he was... Yeah, if old. anyone knows, give us a ring. Yeah. Because I s saw him working in a music shop in... I think that was Smith Street, right up the top end of Smith Street. Yep. And he went to uni and did a doctorate and all that sort of thing. So. Yep. So what happens um, What happened to the Fuse? I know that, like, um, when you arrived, Hap, you kind of mentioned that the um, one of the first kind of solo pieces that you heard from uh, Pat was a little, was a tape that um, Ryder had of those two songs. Um, oh, yeah, that was actually vinyl. Oh, it was oh, a vinyl yeah, swimming well, pool a single, and um, yeah. yeah, well, I probably did that edition. vinyl single. That was, thinking, 1984, 1985, and I just released that myself. It was just like a solo seven-inch single. Wow. That's really cool. Which is... Um, do you still... Does Ryder still have a copy of that? He would, yeah. And that's when I first met Ryder. He's, he played me a few different things. He played me The Wreckery. He played me Velvet Underground. Oh, wow. He played me um, Leonard Cohen and he played me Pat McCabe's um, Double A. I think it's a Double A, really. He's got Swimming Pool and Miss Audrey Dash. They're both killer, killer it pops singles. up on, you know, like those eBay or some of those sites every now and then. But I yeah, wow. Well. I wouldn't say it's... If you got one at home, I wouldn't like give up the oh, day no, job. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty special. I don't think people would have parted with them if, once they had them. Totally. That, and that idea of the old singles, the actual double A singles, well, like, it, pretty cool. It's funny, I remember this bloke, I got this letter in the mail and he posted this C, uh, single, sorry, 70 single back to me, and he found it in this op shop in Glasgow. Wow. And he goes, yeah. oh, I found this, I thought you might want it. Like, yeah. Yeah, it was... Just, That's you know, bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. 
And it, it sort of goes back to a time, you know, when the world was a, a lot bigger or something, you know, like you'd, if you're a fan, you'd have to join a fan club and yeah. you know, post a letter and then wait um, a month and then you get this letter, you know, like the letter you got from Laird and Rainwright. And yeah, yeah. Where these days it's more, you know, you just get them line and then you go, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. And Yeah, it's just not quite the same, is it? Exactly. But yeah. Um, I think some record companies now are trying to go down that path of being a record club like the old days, I think. Yeah. yeah. Which is cool. But it, back in those times. You get that mystique too, like, you know, that you sort of got the album and you're there. I wonder what that means. And you just yeah. spend hours just pondering and totally it had that mystique build up. Whereas now it's almost like fast food. It's like, here it is. Yeah. Go we know it. everything. I know yeah. everything about a movie or a book or a song before I've seen, read or heard it now. Cause I'm just on Buzzfeed or something. And they're talking yeah. about the latest horror movie. And I could probably review it without seeing it now because everybody just gives everything away now. Yeah. But I digress. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> so then you became solo. Um, well, you went back to just doing your own thing. More or less, yeah, because then had a res- residency at the camp hotel with Don Neander, who was used to play in the Five O'Clock Shadows cover band, doing country sort of rock and roll with Terry. Yeah. And then Don and I did a bit of duo stuff. Just He was an amazing guitarist. Don still is. He's in Perth now. And we were just doing a duo and then... Don had enough and then I just took on the duo and did like a Tuesday night at the camp for I don't know how many years and just more or less got away with doing my own stuff and like the, pretty much the art crew from uni and school of mines all come along and yep. it's a bit of the... Seemed like a student night, the yeah, Tuesday nights. Sort of unofficial, yeah. Yeah. But I was just lucky to get that crew and... And you just kept riding through that period Yeah, too. yeah put out a great tape called Hope, which I've got. Wow. Um, was it, that was kind of the later period of your solo yeah, work, would that yeah, be right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, that was more or less just live in the studio, just yeah, a, a some, cassette tape. Yep, killer songs on that one. Um, you'd gone to Tasmania and you sort of, I yeah. felt like you'd had a real burst of songwriting yeah, kind I of went with, inspiration. went with Glenn, who's uh, where we were, on the main bar owner, and we went for this trip in um just trying to think of a date of that but that was probably 85 or something mm-hmm. keeps getting back at 84 anyway not sure of the year but yeah we and we sort of went to this folk festival and that's what that song's about the spanish lady which um christine's going to be singing that's right so that'll be interesting mm. yeah well wow. it's interesting to hear these sort of songs I, initially i sort of was a bit overwhelmed when hat put this to me and i'm thinking uh but then, as you said, you know, we lost poor old Patio and then Peter Crevin, you know, rest, rest their souls. And I just thought, well, life's too short, you know, we're just going to go with this and just, you know, there might be a few cringy moments, but we'll just go for it. And I guess that's the thing, like, kind of talking about, a, you know, the 80s and stuff, which it's weird to think that that's, you know, over 30 years ago now, isn't it? It's just yeah, crazy to yeah. think that, but it is. Yeah. And, um, as you mentioned, like, you know, Patio a few years ago yep. and then Krebin this year, yep. it's um, it really puts things in perspective about how, t- how much time has elapsed and how important time actually is in some respects, that's for sure. And I think it's amazing that Happy you've put this together for um, Paddy McKay because he is a very, um, is a great cultural kind of exponent and songwriter of this town who... Um, Perhaps is a bit underrated, I think, actually, Paddy, to be honest. Like, you know, well, you're a legend. We'll find out on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we'll be bashing them down. I've been getting lots but, of yeah messages from people going, well, because the 8 o'clock show different to the 9.30 show? <laughs> <laughs> the different musicians playing? I've got to know, man. Jesus. Uh, well, just, just the thing I mentioned, I probably read it somewhere the other day on Facebook or something. You know, when people say 30 years ago, they automatically think back to the 70s or the, you know, but that, yeah, that constraint of time or whatever it is that you know what is time yeah. nirvana's never mind is 25 years old that makes me feel yep. yeah pretty um old i guess totally but we'll um <laughs> we'll run through we might um play a song and uh, we'll come back and have a bit more of a chat this is um this is you pat live at um, Ratnet in 2000 with the song donkeys introduced by brent luke oh yeah 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 it's been up on the uh, the tube for a while, yeah. Tell us a bit about this song, and um, can you remember this particular performance? I can 
because it's a fact it's on YouTube, yeah, but we were just upstairs <laughs> after or between one of those live to air that Rexy used to do upstairs and Rexy, you know, he's amazing. He just used to be borrowing all this equipment and have, you know, bits of wire here and <laughs> carrier pigeons and just, um, it was incredible. You know, you think the technology, even back then, you know, how much it's changed. And I think he used to have to get a, a landline or a, some line from Telecom or Telstra for the night. You'd have to hire this special line to get it back to the studio. And yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the stuff he did even pre-internet when it was going live on this station, when yep. it was Triple B, when um, he would have eventually have an act um, playing at the pub. Um, yeah. From and and that was incredible. And he's just yeah, the amount of work that guy's done and the amount of stuff that he has. Uh, it's pretty sensational. Yeah, it is. You could have a uh, whole a year long exhibit of um, Rex Hardware's wares. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. But um, here it is, Donkeys li uh, live at Ratnet two thousand with Pat McCabe, and we'll be back in um, a couple of minutes for a bit more of a chat with Patty and Happy here in the studio. Wherever it is, I hope. Do you want to play us a tune? What tune are you going to play, Patrick? Well, I'm. I'm I don't know, I haven't decided. I might do donkeys. Oakley dokley. And you've got the radio show at the other place. Oh, the other place, yeah, Triple R. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Go for it. That's why she told me She told me with some regrets She told the darkies all the secrets You know how word gets around in this town Dress up in her room. We got worried because we thought it passed your back real soon. It's Easter time now. How those years have flown. Something that she believes Donkeys talk on Christmas Eve At least that's what her granddad told her
And there's uh, Pat McCabe live at Ratnet 2000 with the song Donkeys. And uh, I've got Hap and Pat in the studio right now, and we're talking about um, a very Ballarat evening of music. The songs of Pat McCabe at the main bar, which of course is on Main Road. Um, this Friday night there'll be two shows one at 8pm and one at 9.30pm um, free entry for Songways ticket holders or $10 for the show only um, the Dead Salesman duo will be playing um, a bunch of Pat McCabe songs along with Stella Savvy Earl Leonard, Christine Allen, Emma Grant Troy Wilson 23rd of Elvis, hopefully Terry Byrne will um, roll up and of course Pat McCabe himself and um, I Lawrence, guess Lawrence Nolte. Oh, yeah, Lawrence Nolte oh, Lawrence and Lawrence Jeff Nolte. Hassel. Jeff the, Hassel. Um, the, uh, the vest guys have yeah, been... Of course, yeah. Will be... Uh, the vest was our little fun band we had the last couple of years at just doing covers and... Um, Hap was the singer who turned drummer and then Lawrence was the drummer who turned bass player and Jeff was the drummer who turned guitarist and... Yeah, you were the only legitimate member of the band. Well, I wouldn't <laughs> say that either, but... <laughs> but we should have played the bagpipes or the. We were talking, Dan West. I've just got to mention he gave this whole idea of, of doing the gig, and he said we need a house band. And he was mentioning some excellent musicians, local and otherwise. But I just thought because I'd worked with the Vest, and I think it's it, uh, a lot easier to get things together when you've worked with people and you have a rapport with them, and um, um, they're just great players. So I thought. Totally. Uh, let's have this as a house band and, and work around the night that way. Um, and that's been quite successful because um, when you bring different elements in sometimes, it doesn't always combine, yeah. does it? No. Yeah. No. Totally. And um, I guess just continue on from our conversation before, Pat, you were saying um, kind of in the um early 90s you um you started playing with did you start playing with the five o'clock shadows at that point with yeah, Terry well probably going at the same time as the fused okay yeah can you tell me about the first time that you met terry Byrne and what was your impression of him because uh he's quite a colorful character yeah. for people out there that aren't familiar with terry yeah no we were rehearsing this night um at ian noyce's guitar making business out in mount helen in the bush and they said, oh, we've got this guy coming along tonight and he's going to sing a few songs. And that was Terry, yeah. He sort of walked in and he sort of made an impression. <laughs> Definitely. And then that was, yeah, probably spent quite a few years with Terry. We did a lot of playing around and the five o'clock shadows become the two o'clock shadows. Yeah. As like a duo thing, Terry was on the drums and harmonica and... Yeah, no, it was a pretty wild ride there for a while. I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> but uh, as you mentioned, Happy, at the start of our conversation, um, Pat used to play at the camp a lot. He had a lot of residencies and stuff there. And um, I guess I just want to hear from your perspective, Pat, how you've seen, like, you know, going through the um, Bridgemore Lynn kind of scene from its very beginning um, yeah. and then seeing, you know, I guess the uh, the camp and the bridgey kind of closing down, then Granary Lane opening, yeah. closing down, then the Mallow, and then the Crover yeah. Lounge now. What's your kind of yeah, overall no, well, for evolution? For a while there, there? Was, yeah, like the camp, and then I might have went to the Mallow, and then then to the Bridge Mall, and then, yeah, Kiri sort of got me every Friday night at the Granary Lane there for quite a few years. So, But, um, yeah, it always sort of ebbed and flowed a bit, you know, like sort of... And I remember the time when the camp was really pumping in the bridgey and then the camp had finished and everyone had run down through the mall and get to the last of the bridgey like that's right depending who was playing but yeah bands would uh, would work it out whether consciously or subconsciously it might be the fat thing at the um uh camp hotel and then the dead salesman would go on about half an hour later and everyone would walk in and yeah. sometimes we wouldn't go on till about 1 30 or oh, something it was just get r ridiculous sometimes the uh, and that, I remember the last night of the salesman at the bridge and then everyone, there was couches out in the street, in Peel Street, and yeah. people would just walk down with their couches and they were just cr sitting outside because they couldn't get in for a start. Well, Yeah, the owner at the time decided he wouldn't open upstairs for that night. <laughs> I found out during the sound check. <laughs> but uh, so people did their thing. But um, I was just thinking of Kiri, Kiri Smart. She's another one talking like Rex Hardware. There's been these champions of yeah. of the arts and music scene 
hasn't there? Oh, yeah. They've just, uh, during the, the dry patches, yeah. um, have just waved the flag. She's certainly one of them. Totally, yeah. The amount of work at Granary Lane that um, she did keeping uh, a scene relatively together and... For sure. And then watching this burgeoning art scene and... Yeah. Um, and a lot of drama and theatre and performance art. And it was pretty wild, Granary Lane. Yeah. And then you had that, you know, people like, you know, meeting and then starting other bands and what the Tostados would be a floating sort of, you know, play with them for a while and Stella staying with them for a while and then okay. you had this real floating, but there's sort of like a real c- camaraderie there too. Like the, just the first practice we had for this, I missed the first two because I was still a bit unaware, hang on, I'm not sure. And I thought, oh, and I turned up. And then I said to Hap, you know, we're all sitting around and all, t- you know, it's almost like uh, the Woody Allen movie Broadway, Danny Rose. You know, these old uh, comedians and entertainers in New York, and they all meet at this uh, cafe. And yeah, yeah. They're yeah. all telling the stories, you know, ah, oh, there I was. And, you know, it, it, he's a real failed um, agent, isn't he? Yeah, he's yeah, always trying agent. To, Yeah, but it's, it's a bit like that, you know. We, we all got that history and... Probably, you know, like we've all been sort of had our moments and on playing places and, you know, just those sort of war stories. It's like totally really good to get out and share them and then. Yeah. Our good stories and also <laughs> <laughs> the bad. Can and you give us an yeah. example of you, a story with you, like both of you? In, um, I've got a bad one that I always bring up to Hat, but. Go on, you tell me. This oh, is the on. one I always bring up about happen. <laughs> I'll never forget it, like, as long as I'm on this mortal coil. But, yeah, they were supporting the... Salesman was supporting the Screaming Jet oh, in New, yeah. Newcastle. Yeah. Wow. Like, wow, whereabouts um, in Newcastle? No, Wollongong. Oh, Wollongong. Wollongong. So they're from Wollongong, weren't they? Yeah, they might have been. So they had to, you know, like, <laughs> load all the gear in. And Hap got the job he had to polish, like, the drummer's cymbals. Yeah, had wow. brasso and a rat in a rag, <laughs> yeah. and they gave it to me. And all the rest of the band are sitting in the seats after we've loaded all day for them, because that was part of the contract <sighs> uh, back in those days. And I just remember Ryder or Lenny yelling out, don't do it, it's beneath you. <laughs> and I did it. I polished their cymbals. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't get much lower than that. I love it if there was a photo of that. Oh, that'd well, be good. I remember we did Jealousy, the last song, and, you know, the, all these people up the back wouldn't come near us. And, and they'd probably yell and get off. Or, oh, yeah. And then they said, I said, this is our last song, and, and they run towards the stage because they're hoping to catch Dave, what's his face? And Gleason. Again. Yeah. And um, we're singing Jealousy, and, yeah, the look on their faces, it was just like, we were very happy to get out of there anyway. But yeah. um, another good thing, I think, is just the amount of years makes us all very, very... Um, uh, aware of our mortality, I think, and I think just getting together um, is really important these days because despite the fact that we're on social media a lot, well, I am, I don't have that interaction as much anymore, that human interaction. Yeah, so no, you're right. There's nothing like a band to make you feel that again. Totally. Yeah. What's, um, over the years, Pat, how would you perceive the... Um, kind of the Ballarat art scene, do you think that there was a, is a kernel of um, kind of a, the spirit of um, the Ballarat kind of music scene that's carried on through the years, or do you think it's... Yeah, I definitely think that, and, um, you know, like the Eastern now and, you know, some of the young crew coming through and, yeah, like my mate's son, he's in uh, Requiem, Gil Gunderson, and, you yeah, I remember him as just a little, you know, like, I don't know how tall he was or old he was, but... And now they're out, you know, booking tours and, you know, it's it's sort of perpetual. It's great, like, and um, it's great now that obviously, like, the council are thinking we're going to make this a music city like Tamworth or put a bit of funding for this Songways. And, you know, at the time when the Bridge Mall closed, Bridge Mall Inn Hotel, and then it was all this stuff, oh, you know, it was a bit too late. It was all over. Sort of like they missed a boat a bit or something with... yeah. For, like, for yeah. a while, they, you know, it was like, the, I think the cops used to call the Bridge Mall in like the Star Wars bar, you know, when you go into Star Wars and all those people are drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what the cops used to call it, I think. It was <laughs> one of the, ironically, it was one of the safest places in town. Like, if I ever ventured out to where my older brothers were going, like the bloody 
you know, you could get your head kicked in by someone who worked in a bank, but um, yeah. you never, you never <laughs> exactly. really, it just didn't seem to happen. And you had people's backs, like I know people from the from different sorts of communities and different sorts of sexualities or whatever who would be um, supporting and supported by people with uh, tats all over them and, um, uh, yeah. you know, we it, really looked after It people. probably was then, you know, that place where if you were a little bit alternative or something, you had your little... Your tribe, you know? Yeah. Where and then they become more mainstream, you know, like you know, you go in the shop now and the supermarket and the checkout chicks got tattoos and um, earring in the nose and And wearing a Ramones t shirt. Yeah, exactly. And which is all right. But when you <laughs> ask him if they know the Ramones <laughs> Oh I don't want to be judgmental. <laughs> <kids. laughs> look, oh, God bless them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the world once again I reckon the world was and, you know, it was almost like you had Triple B and Triple J and mm. you really have to search out for that, something that was, you know, making you interested. And yep. I remember hearing the Smiths on Triple B for the first time and, and so many other acts and Rex Hardware was on this on, on this with Janet McLeod yeah, and yeah, Rick Trembath. Yeah. Didn't know them for a, a, to look at, but I was listening to them as a teenager before I met them yeah. on Thursday nights. And yeah. What a great alternative music used to be played on, or what was being played on this station. <laughs> for, I mean, when I was young, yeah. it's very inspiring. Ooh, I think I'm starting to lose it. Do you, think, do you think that over the years, as you mentioned, that the internet's really kind of changed the, the whole landscape, even in a local scene like Ballarat and internationally as well? Oh, I'd say you'd have to, you know, it's probably killed that and for the, traditional music industry. For the worst, do you think? I don't know. I wonder how how is it going for you, Matt? Because I really loved your I've album you put out this year, and you've done a little bit of touring. Mm. Where um, is the is, is the cyber world sort of assisting you in your in your music? It's it's really strange because I um I talk to a lot. Of, I've got most of my mates are either you know musicians or you know trying to struggling musicians and whatnot, and. Um, the constant thing that we often talk about is like, oh, damn, we wish we were born earlier so we could have lived just before the internet. So mm. that you, because there seems like now it's it's really hard to um, make any kind of make ends meet as a musician. I mean, it's always been hard, but now it's even seemingly even harder. Yeah. And like you know, on the internet right now, you can you can um, get my record for free for a free download you can just pick it up somewhere and it's like you know i think that sharing culture and information i think it's it's a good thing and stuff but when it comes to the kind of um just the the grassroots level of everyday living and wanting to be a musician and that's been your dream or whatever since you're a kid or whatever it might be and you're like having to deal with the technological kind of um momentous kind of uh, machine of the internet it's kind of feels like it's working against you but you kind of try and work it to your advantage i guess but it's very very difficult i reckon one thing technology is great because obviously yeah there's people in their land rooms and bedrooms and yeah you know creating this music yeah whereas once you were paying 120 dollars an hour or whatever and so in one sense it's good that totally yeah this but then, yeah it's just a matter of everyone's just, doing it. I just think there's so much music. As you say, everyone's doing it. There's so much music out there as well. It's really hard as a young musician to get your head above water in this huge sea of um, DIY um, independent musicians. They're all doing something, and it's really hard to stand out. It's really difficult. What do you think? Hap what's your analysis on it? Well, we were talking about the, um, the punters factor and how much things have changed, and the one thing that kept the scene sort of um, solidified what I was doing and, and was that there were people like the um, arts crew from the yeah. uh, uni and um, there were people from SMB coming to see you. And uh, um, and I know there are cr crowds out there, but a lot of venues have struggled locally mm. to sustain um, an audience, I really. Yeah. And it's so ironic because there's so much music and a lot of it's fantastic. So many musicians. Um, we just got to try and bring up that audience factor to. I was just saying before, you'd wait for Friday night to go out and see a band. Yeah. You didn't actually know or care who the band yeah. would be, but you just walk in there, maybe five bucks at the door, and um, and have 
uh, he's watched three or four bands and yeah. um i think um that isn't as it doesn't seem uh to be happening as fluidly or something around the venues and totally. i know some venues suffer from it well, people are more selective in a way are they maybe uh, it's like as you you know you played at the whisker thing on saturday night there's a venue that's been going for five years that's pretty much like skirting the point of yeah. closing down great sound system and, yeah. and um it's um you know at ballarat as we discussed that the before this you know it's like nearly got a hundred thousand people in ballarat um we've got one of the biggest regional universities in australia and there is a thriving art scene here but no venue seems to be able to really make something of it i guess i don't know and as you say audience members are dwindling all throughout the world for live music unless you're um you know, a band like the Rolling Stones or something, you know. If you can tap into that <coughs> university thing, because I'd just forgotten that, but we used to go out and watch bands like the um, Painters and Dockers. Uh, there'd be bands playing all the time. Um, and then you'd come in and see something local. And there was that full-on relationship between Barrett University and the art scene and the music scene. And um, something dried up in terms of the unions or something. Well, what happened? You can't expect, I suppose, to have that. You can't get. I remember yeah. that Bridgemore when they had Pete and uh, Pete and um, the two publicans before Skipper. Pete and Wayne. Pete and Wayne, thanks. And they did the big orientation week posters and flyers, and they had the whole, you know, Monday all planned for a Saturday. And I remember like we were sitting there, no one turned up. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, oh, here we go, like, yeah. It didn't quite work. No. Bugger. Anyway. But I used to love going out to uni because you'd get those 70 cent cups of wine and and here I am today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. No, for good thanks, Matt. Thanks for I really us. appreciate it. And um, so if you want to do the honours, Hap, what's happening this Friday night? Okay, this Friday night uh, at the um, main bar, we, we were honouring Pat McCabe. It was uh, a bit of a worry. Some people were sending messages saying, what's happened to Pat? Thinking I he think might the initial wording on. of the ad was a bit... Um, yeah, that was my fault too. It was said on the oh. privilege, pri uh, the uh, um, pri pilgrimage, no pilgrimage, or uh, legacy, legacy, legacy. So, yeah, it was sounding a bit sort of morbid, or yeah, but anyway, I'm feeling <laughs> fine. Anyway, it's great advertising <laughs> because it got people talking, <laughs> crying, but talking, yeah. <laughs> um, and Pat's such a trooper because he didn't, he was saying, I don't want to be the, the guy of this party, and I really had to. Um, subtly keep convincing him so and I know it'd be weird it'd be like it's your party everyone seems to have the best time except you yeah. but he's been absolutely awesome and I'll cry if I want to yeah exactly I guess that legacy thing is like what we were discussing before we've had a few you guys in particular have had some really close mates who are great musicians and um, that have passed away over the last couple of years and you know even internationally we've seen people like David Bowie which was a huge thing on an international basis as well it's um it would be a shame to not do an event like this for someone like yourself, Pat. And it's great that you've put it together, Happy, that's for sure. Oh, again, I'd like to thank um, Glenn from the main bar and Dan West um, and the crew from Songways Music Festival. Uh, of course, our, our good mate Lou Ridsdale. And I'm sure there's a few names, but Lou's I hope the this... publicist, isn't she? Yeah. That's so right. thanks, Lou, because for the reminder today we would probably wouldn't have made it you've been no. yeah lou's great yeah. yeah i'm in contact with her a lot yeah she's awesome yep she's a fantastic person to ha have in this town and this songways music festival i really hope um something comes of it yeah know? um so it's a cancel based kind of scenario it is yeah and um good luck to it because yeah it'd be great to see those um venues filling up and people going out and enjoying Friday live night. music because yeah. those other guys here playing earlier on, there's a few things happening in the lane somewhere. That's right. There's Part different of the venues. Festival, and then yeah. Saturday there's buskers in the mall, stages set up, and other gigs at night. And, and then Sunday, Sunday I think it's jazz maybe at the main bar. I think. Yep, there is. Um, Songways. Jazz. Matt Mavis is playing Aged. at Babs as well. Yeah, Matt Mavis is playing at Babushka on Friday night. Is it Friday or Saturday? Oh, I hope it's Saturday. I hope it's Saturday too. And Paige Duggan. <laughs> She's probably the jazz on yeah. Sunday. Yeah, so they, they've got all these great artists and um, yeah, great genres, different genres and things. And it's all over the weekend and you can pick up tickets um, through the Facebook page. 
Ballarat Songways Festival. If you just type that in, it'll come up with um, the link and you can uh, follow the links and pick up a ticket for their entire weekend. And, um, it's pretty cheap too, isn't it? Yeah, it's not that much. It's I like, can't recall exactly what it is. I should know, but I think it's just only about 30 Getting back to, you know, like the cancel and it's great the funding and all that because, you know, you're getting all these people into town and you still need your artists and the musicians for the culture. Like, otherwise you just get this sterile... You know what happened in New York in the 80s or the gentrification? And as you know, when you're in Melbourne, like Fitzroy and... Yeah. And now everyone's moving out to Preston and further out even, like, because the artists can't afford to be living in the... Yep. You know, they're the ones that make the coffee and totally. make the places groovy that yep. people want to come and hang out in. That's yeah. it. You mm. bet. You've got to keep that. You've got to keep that alive. What is life worth living for if you don't have this sort of stuff? I'm sorry, but it's true. And hopefully an event like this supported by the council will help some younger musicians too coming up through the ranks to, you know, be inspired to stick with it, you know? Yeah, if any young person, like I was at 17, listening to Triple B back in the day, <coughs> has heard anything from Pat McCabe this evening that, um, oh, if they're 17, they can't go to the pub. Oh, just try and sneak in anyway. Yeah. The main bar, you might uh, be on your I reckon, journey. I reckon yeah. Earl, <laughs> Earl was coming to gigs. I reckon Earl Leonard was about... 14 or something, I reckon. Yeah, Patio and all those guys, yeah. um, they used to take off their St. Pat's uniforms in the mall and stuff them under a bench or something. Yeah. Change into their civvy gear and um, walk into the bridge mall yeah. with their... Which, uh, and that was good. You know, then they started playing the Mockingbirds and then Patio went on to write some great songs. and yep. So it's that, you know, like, yeah, the handing on the bat and more, that's what we want, you know. Well, I did. I used to take off. Like you're doing yourself. I used to take off my St. Pat's uniform and sneak into the Grey Lane when I was 15 years old, 14 years old. (laughs) Yeah, it's a tradition. It just, it does. It happens. (laughs) That's for sure. But um, but this Friday, mate, you were going to tell me what was happening with it all. (laughs) Oh yeah, and I got rest, didn't I? So we're doing this night for Pat. We've got the Dead Souls and Duo, Christine Allen, Stella Savvy, Emma Grant, 23rd of Elvis, Earl Leonard doing one of my favourite songs, Alcoholic War. Troy Wilson, um, he's doing Drug House and um, uh, Postman, I think, some other great songs. Jeff Hassel, who's been fantastic uh, with the vests, and Lawrence Nolte, um, can't stand the guy, but he'll be there. No, I'm kidding. I love him. (laughs) And Dan West, he's uh, playing um, with the vests as well. Please come, because it's going to be awesome. There's two shows. There's the 8 p.m. Sober Show and the 10 (laughs) p.m. No, the the 10 p.m. Show. Yes. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you say It'll that. It'll be different dynamics, I would say. Yeah, we'll probably get those nerves, you know, settled by the first yeah, show. Yeah. yeah. But you're not probably, that I'm saying. Oh, we're professionals. One will be better, or no, not at all. But it feels, you know, we're going to have a sound check. We've got a publicist. We're doing two shows. It's almost like a pain in mine or something. Yeah. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> how do you, just as a parting kind of comment, Pat? How do you feel about? being celebrated like on this friday night yeah well like i said uh matt like i was initially you had you know uh, sort of almost hiding in peeking out the curtains and you know being a bit overwhelmed but yeah like then i just thought well hang on like you may as well just jump on and yeah go for the ride and see how it, you know like it's just going to be interesting people sing songs and different keys and you know it's just I'm going to enjoy it, hopefully. I'm sure I will. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And Pat's obviously playing guitar in the vest and he's going to finish the night with whatever he wants to finish the night with, mm. basically. Awesome. Bit it's going to be great. Anthrax, a bit of, bit of Metallica. We, we've got an update on Robbie Bell, too. I don't know if you wanted to mention. Oh, yeah, Robert oh, Bell yeah. from The Fuse, the great drummer, um, Don Kirby's protege in the late 80s. And uh, Rex sent me a message at um, quarter past seven. He said, Robert Bell from The Fuse is a lecturer and a co-coordinator at Victoria University in music. There you go. Ah, well, poor yeah. bugger. Well, <laughs> really hope you had a future. <laughs> I got a job at the hospital, but anyway. Hey, I'm a government school teacher and I can't say enough about it. Thank you both so nah, much for you, in. Matt. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thanks for giving us a bit of time. And no worries. And um, so this Friday night, the 14th of October at the main bar, up there on Main Road, it's um, a very Ballarat evening of music. The songs of Pat McCabe. There'll be two shows, one at 8pm, and you just corrected it to 10pm, yeah, for uh, the second one? Well, yeah. 9.30, It just 10. depends uh, what the ride is like. 
I'm kidding. Probably a third show at... Uh... Third show at one thirty in the car park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Trousers optional. It's, um, so there'll be two shows on the night, perhaps there three, and there'll be, um, <laughs> it'll be uh, $10 um, per show. And otherwise, it's um, free entry if you have the um, Songways um, ticket, which you can pick up online at um, if you type in the Google Ballarat Songways Festival. It should come up with the site. You can follow the links and um, pick up a ticket. There's lots of other events on this weekend down the Bridge Mall, down at Sutton's, at Babushka Bar, all across town. And um, Dead Salesman Duo will be performing, and uh, Stella Savvy, Earl Leonard, Christine Allen, Emma Grant, Troy Wilson, 23rd of Elvis, The Vests. Did I miss anyone, Hap? No, I reckon that's pretty good. And Pat McCabe, of Mick, course. Mick oh, now Mick Trimbar's playing. Oh, um, Mick Trimbar. Yeah, yeah, because uh, Mick's going to do an absolutely amazing version of a song, and I won't say because uh, in his own Mick, uh, style. Yeah, Mick come along, and then he's had a few problems with his ears, which is hope gets well. He's been working on for a while. Like. Yeah, he can't really be around loud music yeah, at all. Yeah, so we've so. sort of... Okay. Pity that he, he was part of the band there for a while, but he's um, still in the show, so yeah. No, it's going to be great. So he's going to just play on his own at, at a certain level that's comfortable for him, but uh, it's always worth seeing him and hearing him. It's like the Def Leppard drummer, we wouldn't get rid of him. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Love and I'm going to. I've got, I've got three songs of yours here. Um, Oh. Patrick, which one would you, what you got there? prefer? I've got Charity, Old Coat, and uh, Denham Park. Uh, might go with Denham Park, yeah. just for... Um, we're not doing that on the night, but this... When you <laughs> used to come along to... You, um, you might do it at the end. Oh, I could. This is when you used to come along. He almost went over the Westgate Bridge, and uh, there was a factory on your left, and there was this big, like, woolen factory, and it was a conveyor belt, and painted on the side was this... It was called Denham Park. That's where I got the actual name for the song. Okay. But I thought, oh, it's a real sort of evokes the 70s, like era, and so this song's more or less about the 70s. Okay. Well, That's it's pulled down before I could get the photo and all that, of course. You know. Damn. Here it is. This is um, uh, Pat McCabe with the song Denham Park. Thank you both to Hap. Thanks, man. And to Pat Thanks, McCabe man. himself. And get down this Friday night from 8 p.m., two shows at the main bar. The songs of Pat McKay played by a whole bunch of amazing local musicians. Thank you both very much. Here it is. I'll be back from uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, next week, next Tuesday night, on this very station you're listening to, 99.9 Voice FM. All your vinyl memories Back to the 70s I'll show you something, bring it down to your feelings for me tonight. After dark, we're going down to Denham Park. You know you're never alone when you've got a bottle of stones in, and one can be a star. Well. Whatever happened to Joey Mentor Who meet tonight After dark We're going down to Denham Park Denham Park I still miss you Denham Park I'm gonna kiss you And I miss you Watch you need you Denham Park Down by the 
lake in What if despite the precautions we take well What if something was to break in Of the odds what will they make For me today It's gonna be okay We're going back to Denham Park Denham Park I still miss you Denham Park I'm gonna kiss you And I miss you Aren't you need you Yes I miss you Aren't you need you Yes I miss you Aren't you need you Denham Park This next song is called Pretty High it's called Spit on the Punters, accidentally. It's called Pretty High Land. Who's who's it for? Who wants it? <laughs> okay, Chriso, who does a hell of a job upstairs. Unlike God. I just thought I'd get political. Uh, and that's it. This song is called Pretty High Land. I said that, didn't I? Okay. 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 Two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, come to Granary Lane Theatre and see a hell of a play. Yeah, there it is. That's later on. <laughs> Okay, uh, sorry about that. We're going to uh, rock. Rock like we've never rocked before. I live on pretty hot land And every time I visit you I take my bike and It feels like we're having